among you shall go next. Hey everybody, welcome to the fourth installment in my analysis of Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream CD-ROM game, which as all of you by now will know is my favorite game of any medium. And I am returning to this after a four-year hiatus. A lot of my longtime viewers have really, really, really been wanting to hear the rest of this. And it's something that I wanted to finish, but, you know, as life keeps piling up and piling up, certain things go away on the back burner. Uh, then, um, the, uh, I, I, last week I found myself uh, with a totaled car, unfortunately, and one of my longtime viewers... Uh, offered a uh, very, uh, very reasonable financial incentive uh, for me to uh, finish the uh, finish the series while my uh, while I'm working on getting a new vehicle and everything. So uh, with that in mind, we plunge now into the NIMDOC section of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Uh, since I be since I last did the um, the third installment, a tremendous amount has happened. Not the least of which is the passing of Harlan Ellison and his wife Susan. Uh, both of the both of them have passed away. Susan more recently this year. Um, I did a uh, tribute to Harlan Ellison when he passed away. That can be seen on my channel. It was devastating for me. Uh, to lose uh, not only um, not only my favorite author, but someone who had been a friend and mentor to me as well. Uh, so we uh, so with all of that, my and then also we we in the Harlan Ellison community have been uh, certainly mourning the passing of Susan, who uh, passed away at the very very uh, entirely too young age of sixty. Uh, very unexpectedly. So, uh, in any event, uh, that is uh, that's where it stands, um, and it's it's a time when we need to be renewing interest in Harlan Ellison's work anyway. So, hopefully, this can uh, continue with that. I look forward to getting back into it, um, playing the remainder of "I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream," and. Uh, Finishing, you know, finishing the game and it was very good for me because there is a very cathartic process to this game. It is, it is very much a process of psychodrama to play this game, so it was good for me. And there was a lot to think about. We'll get into all of that uh, as we dig right into Nimdok. Nimdok, you are kindred spirit to me. Even if you don't realize it fully yet, you must sense it there in your blood and fiber. I've constructed an adventure of sorts to revive your failing memory. I want you to find the lost tribe of humanity <laughs> and continue your eminent scientific research. All right, so as we get into it, we are finding that um, the Allied Master Computer has become aware of something called a Lost Tribe of Humanity. And what that Lost Tribe of Humanity is, we will start uh, learning about more and more as the game goes. But this is the critical reveal of why the machine wants to play this game with the humans. And what we're going to find more and more as we go through this is that we start seeing... Uh, we start seeing, we've already seen in the, uh, for example, the coyote in Gorister's level or the talking waterfall in Ellen's level, we see these uh, indicators that um, this program, this game, is actually a manifestation of AM's own subconscious, AM being Allied Master Computer, the AM's, uh, that, of AM's subconscious. And so Am is running this game because he's trying to get the humans to uncover the clues to what this lost tribe of humanity is. He, uh, he's disturbed because he can't get at that information. Now, I don't think uh, I'm giving anything away. Uh, in, I think it's abundantly obvious that uh, Nimdok is a former Nazi uh, concentration camp doctor. And so 
the idea of playing a Nazi concentration camp doctor, uh, let alone a uh, as a sympathetic, to say nothing of playing it as a sympathetic character, was a very controversial idea at the time. The game has been forever banned in Germany uh, for that reason. This compound looks familiar. But why would Arm bring me here to look for a lost tribe? There are gates and fences. Who could be lost in such a secure area? Why are you imprisoned here? You have the features of a man of intellect. Is this an official interrogation, Nimdok? Or are you mocking me? You know me? I thought I did. Until you had me arrested for refusing to condone your experiments. Experiments? I know nothing of experiments. Your sense of humor is as sick as your methods, Doctor. How can you act so innocent after having maimed or killed hundreds since the name of science? You are saying we were colleagues of some kind? Ridiculous! There's no need to distance yourself from me. I was once your friend. Now I am your enemy. Why would I bother to have you imprisoned like this? The regime needed answers, but I stood in your way. Well, now you have them. Do you know of the lost tribe? I must find it. Haven't you taken enough subjects for your experiments, Doctor? Or are there more mass graves to fill? I know nothing of what you talk about. This conversation is over. So, this really starts to get into what is so fascinating about Nimdok as a character, because I would be willing to bet this was the first time, and I, I say this because I obviously have not played all of the many millions of video games that exist, but I would wager this was the first time we had a playable character in a game who was suffering from dementia. And we find in Nimdok someone who is deeply troubled about his past. He has this, this sense that there was something, some kind of moral compromise in his past that he is um, not proud of. And what's so interesting in the character of Nimdok is that he cannot remember his past as a Nazi doctor, but and, and because of that, because he is essentially tabula rasa right now, his basic morality does not revert to the maliciousness and the evil of, uh, of Nazis and uh, certainly of Nazi concentration camp doctors and all of that. It reverts to a sense of a uh, default sense of compassion and a, de a default sense of um, concern for the people, as we as we've seen in this concern and confusion uh, around all of this. And what what is so cool about that to me is it really is saying that this is a person. This was a Nazi, but this is a person who was uh, there. The the National Socialist tendencies in them were made, not born. And that's a very important question to ask as we go on the road to redemption for this character. If this character was a Nazi by default, meaning that this he was some sort of sick sociopath uh, that could not that um, arrived at that state naturally and by default, rather than having been conditioned into that, um, he would it would be much harder to find his underlying humanity or, or find a deeper humanity in him because there would be no evidence that it ever existed at all. So it's a very um, it, it's a very profound thing for a video game where most games, you know, it's kind of like in my own writing, I don't like to write about Nazis in my own writing because it's kind of like they're a ready-made bad guy. You know, what, whatever I write in a story if I say the bad guy's a Nazi, then that explains all of his motivations, and that's as far as I have to go with it. You know, I could write a story about a guy that goes around buggering puppies, and if I said he was a Nazi, you would say, oh, okay, well, that's that. So Nazis in fiction are so overplayed because it's such a ready-made bad guy. Um, 
And for that purpose, it's actually very interesting and very compelling to see something that's actually stripping away the layers. Now, the dementia aspect of it is going to be very important as well. And I also like that this is really, like I said, the first piece of interactive media that really explores this. Uh, in the mid-90s, you know, Alzheimer's was still the uh, just vile bastard that it was, and I, I lost my grandfather to Alzheimer's, by the way, so I have a bit of a personal connection to that. Uh, it was still the vile bastard that uh, it always has been, but we didn't know as much about it, and we didn't communicate as much about it, and in the years since, we have seen such an explosion of expression via the internet and via the um, immediacy of the the uh, the, the means of production that are open to all of us. One great example of something that really explores Alzheimer's disease is um, Everywhere at the End of Time by The Caretaker, which if you've never heard that, it's a six and a half hour uh, concept album that uses deteriorating audio to illustrate the effect of uh, the onset of dementia, the gradual onset of dementia and the effect of that. And this is this is one of the first games that are, are the first pieces of interactive media that went there and it's going to go there hard you must let me leave i have urgent business elsewhere i cannot let you pass doctor you're due in surgery dr mengele's orders Where have you been, Nimdok? We are waiting on you to perform. You were waiting for me? I am sorry that I will not be able to assist in the operation. After all, this may be the last opportunity we have together before the end of the war to finish our research. Ah, yes, the research. Let us talk about this research. We will have time for that after the surgery. Meet me at the complex later. A youth with 1945 stamped beneath. There is something familiar about this. Finally, Doctor. Everyone's waiting on your expertise. He is not conscious. What am I to do? Ah, you are testing me because I'm new here. Today's procedure requires the removal of the lower section of the subject's spinal cord. What is the purpose of such a procedure? You and Dr. Mengel will process the spinal fluid from this and the other adolescent subjects. The fluid will then be used to formulate the serum. What is the nature of this serum? I cannot reveal sensitive regime secrets in such a public setting. You need not worry, Doctor. I remember my military training as well as my medical knowledge. What is Dr. Mengele's position? Dr. Mengele is the master surgeon of this facility and one of the regime's finest minds. You are fortunate to be his associate. So the Dr. Mangala, the character that spoke to us in the previous room and the one that's being now referred to uh, by the anesthesiologist, was a real person, Dr. Joseph Mangala, one of the most horrifying and um, vile people in the entire history of National Socialism, and given the history of National Socialism, that is definitely saying something. Uh, he was a research doctor at Auschwitz-Birkenau, uh, but this was really, really all of his experiments and research amounted to was coming up with vile and disturbing ways to torture the patients. Um, and there's no, there's no indication that his research actually yielded anything useful. Uh, in the course of the game here, they are going to uh, entertain the idea that uh, his research uh, contributed to um, 
uh, made a long-range contribution to the creation of the Allied Master Computer and all of that, um, but in reality, no indication that his research uh, actually accomplished anything or was anything other than torture. Uh, unfortunately, unlike so many people involved in uh, National Socialism, uh, Joseph Mengele eluded capture until the day that he died after, so he was never, never faced justice for his crimes. And uh, after World War II, he was smuggled to uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he started a new life in South America. Now, what is interesting is you will hear, Mitzi says hi, you will hear uh, in the course of this level and uh, elsewhere where Nimdok is discussed, you will hear about him having a life in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, in South America, Brazil, Buenos Aires, this area as well. And the reason for that, as uh, Ellison discusses in the Official Strategy Guide, was that the original idea was to have uh, Nimdok and Joseph Mengele be homosexual lovers, secretly be homosexual lovers, and let, you know, let that play into the plot of the level as well. They ultimately were not able to, didn't ha you know, they did not have the, uh, the time or the, uh, the, the, the time or, should I say, um, spatial considerations within the game to explore that um, since it wasn't directly related to the plot but that is why you will hear about these things uh, related to Nimdok that sound like he also escaped along with Mangala because the idea was supposed to be that they were gay lovers and that's how he uh, that's how Nimdok escaped uh, justice for his role in the Holocaust What is your function? I will be administering ether to the subject throughout this procedure. We would not want this little maggot to stir and ruin your handiwork. I will begin the procedure momentarily. It will be an honor to work under you, Dr. Nimdok. The scalpel is coated with dried blood. I doubt that anyone has bothered to sterilize it. I'm sorry, Doctor. The ether is necessary for the surgery. Guards, come here quickly! Dr. Nimdok has gone berserk! I must leave before the guards apprehend me. This must be the recovery room. This patient has been too damaged by his surgery to live a normal life. This patient will never recover. It is difficult to see what purpose this surgery serves other than to mutilate the patient. There is he I smell burnt flesh, but this is obviously not a kitchen. According to these records, Hundreds of corpses were incinerated here. There is an inscription on the watch, but it is written in Latin. These pliers must be used for extracting gold fillings and teeth from the corpses. These ovens are more monstrous than anything Am has ever constructed. I have not felt such heat since I lived in the Brazilian rainforest.
How could you so foolishly be caught in the fires? I was trying to escape, but I was so weak. I fell and got caught. Why do you... That timing was hardly of my own choosing. I learned that I was to be among the next batch of volunteers. For what were you being given the privilege to volunteer? Experimentation, they say. Extinction is more like it. Surely you of all people know the regime's plan for the lost tribe. I will call the guard. Why? So the guard can taunt me as I die a slow death? I will summon one of the doctors. No, I'm better off here than under the knives of you butchers. There is not... You can at least help me end my misery. That would give you the pleasure of seeing another one of us die, you cold-hearted bastard. Oh, that feels much better. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, I heard this in the hospital when the doctor thought I was sleeping. Waken the sleeper, utter the truth, and kiss him. He is free, but he has lost consciousness. I hope you are happy with the regime that you set up. Your science could have saved the world. Instead, it conquered it. What is the importance of the year 1945? It seems to have some significance. Never forget the year 1945, Nimdok. That was when the truths about you and your unholy experiments came out. I seem to recall that you speak Latin. What is engraved on this watch? The engraving says time is truth, and since your time is running out, I'll keep the watch. I am starting to recall that you do have cause to hate me. You want to make amends? Get me out of here! Continue your research. The extinction of the lost tribe is near at hand. The regime shall vanquish all of its enemies. What have you done to deserve removal of your eyes? Please, disconnect the wires. Why are your optic nerves wired to the eyeballs in the jar? Please, disconnect the wires. This should ease your suffering. The things I see now, a trinity of three beasts, one like us, one from the east, one from the steppes. They speak in numbers. So the trinity of three beasts would be the uh, three uh, core components of the Allied Master Computer, that being the one from the East is the Chinese, one like us is the American, and one from the Steppes is the Russian uh, supercomputers that all linked up to form uh, what we now know as the Allied Master Computer. They speak in numbers, refers to binary code. A lost tribe of our brothers sleeping on the moon they sleep in darkness, unseen by the beasts. Such a vision, so tiring, I have to rest. So now we get at the piece of information that Am has been trying to locate for so long, namely that 
uh, the Lost Tribe, this Lost Tribe of Humanity is residing on the moon. So we'll come back to what that means in greater detail, but that is the crucial piece of information that Am has been trying to get at. He is not conscious. How are you feeling? I feel okay. I'm not hurt like the others here. Do you know who I am? You are Nimdok? You are more frightening in person than in legend. What do you know of me? The things you do are terrible. We small ones are your lab rats. Are you saying that the doctors here have been using children for experimentation? No, not all the doctors. You and Dr. Mengele sent all the good doctors to the prison yard. So, I am a legend to you. Yes, but we have our own legends. Legends that owe nothing to your regime. You will fail, no matter how many of us you cut apart. Why do you say that the regime will fail? The Golem will finish you. It will not be mastered by your regime. The Golem will wake up, and when it sees with its own eyes the evil you have done, it will turn on you and save us. Get some rest. We will not rest until your regime is destroyed. So a golem is a, and that's golem spelled G-O-L-E-M, not golem like in Lord of the Rings. A golem is a uh, creature from Jewish mysticism that is uh, basically a statue made out of uh, maybe mud or dirt that is brought to life uh, through mystical, uh, mystical means and very often, um, or the, the, very often, the the nature of this creature is not um, initially is not predetermined. It can go uh, it can go either way. It can be used for good or for evil. Uh, and so, in this context, it's being referred to as a um, kind of an avenging angel, an avenging uh, heroic creature, but it can very easily go the other way as well. So as we start to think about the nature of the golem and what it is, we're going to start to see why this uh, symbol uh, plays so prominently into not just Nimdok's level, but the uh, whole construct of the Allied Master Computer as well. There is, there, emergency. Gather all research materials and it is safely hidden in the box. You must let me go. With these materials, I may be able to remedy the atrocities I have committed. You can't fool me, Nimdok. You are an unredeemable butcher. But you are one of us, like it or not. Why do you say that I am one of you? You denied your heritage and turned your own parents into the regime. But you're still a member of the Lost Tribe, and that makes your crimes all the more heinous. Does that mean you will allow me to go? It means that you should have a chance to witness the full extent of your crimes. Then we'll hunt you down and kill you like the dog you are. I must leave this place. It seems I was once the wolf. Now. I am the quarry. I have not seen so many corpses since... Ah, My memory is not what it used to be. Faces! 
faces of people in torture. I know this place. Some of my greatest accomplishments were made here. More for Genix. The ability to reorganize DNA at will. Did Arm discover my work in this area? Is this how he was able to alter Benny and play other cruel tricks on the rest of us? So the answer would be yes, but I want to again clarify that this was not an actual medical innovation of Nazis. This was added specifically for the uh, fictional world of the game. A teletype machine. There is a message in it. The message reads, Cease all work on Project Perfect Image. Confidential. The leader is dead. Having looked on the face of the future using the prototype device, this leaves the regime ripe for invasion. Destroy all work in progress. This technology must not be allowed to fall into the hands of the enemy. The legends are true. This must be the golem of lost tribe folklore. Golem, wake up. Nothing happened. The man caught in the barbed wire said to waken the sleeper. Utter the truth and kiss him. The truth is that this is all an illusion manufactured by Am. The truth is that I regret any crimes I committed in my past life. Time is truth. The truth is that for me it shall always be 1945. Nothing happened. This is... These eyes fit into the column sockets perfectly. I see a mirror. It was obscured by the light. What is... Oh my god! It is true! 1945! Turning my Jewish parents over to the Nazis for extermination! I have found the lost tribe! It is me! So now Nimdok, like all of the other characters in the game, comes to a point of personal realization where he can either be uh, destroyed by the truth or uh, turn towards a path of redemption. What Nimdok just referred to here are two very tragic things that happened, that really did happen in uh, the course of the Holocaust. One was uh, children being uh, so brainwashed by uh, the uh, Third Reich uh, propaganda that they would actually turn their parents into the Nazis if they uh, heard their parents speaking dissent. And the other being that there were in fact Jews who tried to pass themselves off as Aryan uh, to varying degrees to um, to elude uh, capture and imprisonment, and it's uh, Ellison has Ellison writes about both uh, both concepts 
extensively in his other stories, and the Holocaust uh, is a concept that he keeps coming back to, being Jewish himself. It's obviously, it obviously resonates with his personal, uh, in, in his personal history, rather profoundly, pardon me. Anyway, these are two very real concepts. And um, again, just thinking about, as far as the profundity of this game, where else had there has there ever been? I mean, the pretty much the only other major, the the only the only other games that were dealing with Nazism at all were like you know Indiana Jones, Fate of the Atlantis, Wolfenstein 3D. All of those are very Hollywood comic book kind of oriented things, uh, more in the vein of like Nazi exploitation cinema than um, any actual deep digging on the concept. What we see here are two very profound ideas, and now we have to think about uh, the path to redemption and what that's going to entail. And we're going to have to confront another idea, which is, uh, is there a point at which redemption becomes impossible? Now, we're about to invoke the golem, we're about to bring the golem to life, and one of the things, one of the important things to remember is that the golem, uh, the golem is hailed by his people as, as we saw earlier, hailed by his people as a kind of avenging angel, but actually he's morally neutral. And this idea of a very powerful concept that remains morally neutral is something that was at the heart of Harlan Ellison's uh, ideas when he wrote the original I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream short story. The idea being that uh, he saw technology at the time, uh, and you have to remember at the time that uh, the original I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream short story was written, a computer was something that filled an entire room, so it was very easy to imagine these things engulfing us and overtaking us and that kind of thing. Uh, at the time, you know, computer technology was being hailed as the next great step forward for mankind and all of that, and uh, Ellison, deeply aware of the follies of the human race and the follies of the human race as it embraces what it sees as the glorious dawn of tomorrow and that sort of thing, saw the potential for harm that nobody else seemed to be addressing, and his point in I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream the story was that whatever we create is going to have in it, is, is going, whatever we program, whatever we bring into existence in this way, is going to have, uh, it's going to carry with it all of the uh, mental constructs of its creators. Uh, you know, that we, we make something in our image not fully understanding what it means to make something in our image. That's why the Allied Master Computer, when it gains sentience, gains all of the phobias and uh, fears and phobias and um, mental illnesses and everything else of the people that created it. They, that happened as an automatic byproduct of its creation. And that's a very, uh, this is actually an idea that I discussed in a video that I made unrelated to this game, but um, in a video I made called Understanding the Black Pill, talking about the way that the internet and the nature of the internet is shaping the way that we enter, the na shaping the nature of how we interact with one another, and uh, shaping the kind of people that we become as a result. So this is, um, it, it's something that we really have to stop and think about that things that we think are heroic saviors are very often actually morally neutral. And our inability to recognize their reality as morally neutral can very much be used against us. So this is, the golem represents not just uh, the folly of man in that regard, but also a very important symbol as to what it means, as to what technology means and represents within the context of I have no mouth and I must scream. The truth is that for me, it shall always be 1945. Gollum. You are to obey all my orders. Gollum, follow me into the laboratory. 
Nimdok, I was afraid I had lost you back there. It is good to see you and our new friend. How did you escape the mob? Did you forget that the compound has a secret escape route? Well, no matter. I see that you have revived the golem. You know about the golem? Of course! Part of the master plan is to strip the lost tribe of everything, even their folklore. I looked into the mirror. I now remember everything with crystal clarity. The research camps, the serum... Ah, yes, the youth serum. Your research demanded the deaths of many children, but your hard work was successful. Eternal youth for those who deserve it. Now I know how Am was able to keep us alive for so many years. Your use serum can sustain us forever. We have all the time we need to resurrect the regime. Excuse me, Doctor. I need to get a breath of fresh air. Oh my god! No! Dr. Mengele is as pale as a ghost. Gollum, kill Dr. Mengele. He was a pig. So this mirror shows up again in the game. And it's interesting to me, it's tempting to say... Well, you know, because if you look at the icon that you see there on the screen, it's uh, that that mirror with the red uh, the red uh, handle and the red uh, frame and all of that uh, shows up again and again. And it's tempting to say that well, they just used the same icon for the you know to represent multiple different mirrors. But I don't think that's it. I think it's the same mirror throughout. Uh, and when we get into Ted's scenario, it's especially uh, going, the mirror will be especially important there again. And I like to think that what that mirror represents, I, I like to think that it's the same mirror in every level. Uh, and it's always, throughout, it's always seen as um, just, it, it's this tool for smacking people in the face with the truth. And I think it's so interesting with Mangala, see, with uh, Nimdok, when he looks in the mirror, when he sees the truth, when he realizes what he is, he's overcome with grief. He has the capacity for uh, he has the capacity for um, redemption and for reflection, self-reflection. Uh, Mangala, on the other hand, being psychopathic, has no capacity for self-reflection. He can, and so because of that, all he can do is be overcome with the horror of what he is. Uh, he had, you know, and I think that's that's very interesting, and it's very interesting the way that's portrayed. That Mangala does not fall to the floor and uh, have a, you know, a, a kind of road to Damascus moment and realize the wrongness of his actions. His mind is simply fried, and I think that's really cool. Also, obviously, I felt that the uh, crushing of his skull was unbelievably satisfying. Oh, and um, one other thing you do have the option of uh, turning the golem over to Dr. Mangala, and he will then use it to um, uh, demolish the, uh, the Jews that escaped from the concentration camp. And you can kind of see why a game that would give you the option of carrying out acts of anti-Semitism, even though that's very clearly what you are not supposed to do, would be somewhat controversial. Gollum, follow me outside. Nimdok, I knew that you would lead us to where the regime would resume its atrocities. We are here to make you pay for what you did to us. To pay in blood. Gollum, I transfer control of you over to the Lost Tribe. 
So, you admit your crimes. But that does not release you from punishment. Now the golem will serve the purpose for which it was constructed. Golem, kill Nimdok! We are not as alike as I thought, Nimdok. <laughs> the spark of humanity somewhere. Always that wretched little spark. You, you've confronted your past, but you refuse to continue your research. <laughs> That's what I asked you to do. Since you now identify with your victims, I suppose it's only right that I let you experience their tortures, too. Ah, you. You're the last player in my little game. I urge you, do not fail, as the others have failed. So that brings us to the end of the Nimdok chapter. Uh, I think it's very interesting, you know, if you think about it, you have Ellen, who was um, a character who was never responsible for the horrors in her life uh, and knew that she was not responsible. And for her, uh, redemption came in the form of letting go, of, of, stop, of not blaming herself, accepting that she was not at fault. Then you have Gorister, who believed that he was at fault, uh, namely, uh, he thought he was at fault for his wife being put in an insane asylum when, in reality, it was his mother-in-law. Uh, so you have, uh, he, he thought it was his fault. Redemption came in the form of learning it was not. Uh, then you have Benny, who was at fault and knew that he was at fault, and, uh, or, or I should say, was at fault, knew that he did what he did, but did not believe it to be wrong and uh, his salvation came in the form of accepting that yes, in fact, he did do, uh, do something wrong, and, uh, and redeems himself in the eyes of the people that he harmed. Nimdok, we now see somebody who cannot uh, find redemption in the eyes of the people that he harmed. They will, um, they will never forgive him, so the game raises the question, what does it mean to find redemption in, an, in a situation where you cannot be uh, you can you cannot be redeemed in the eyes of the people you have harmed, and uh, it raises an interesting question, uh, a very haunting question of you know I, I personally am, am opposed to the death penalty. I don't believe the government should have the right to kill its citizens, except in um, you know the cases of like active shooters that have to be uh, stopped and stopped in the moment of harming other people, that kind of thing, but. I um, I think it raises the question of would you know would suicide uh, a, a ritual death like what we see here um, would that be a means of redemption if your crimes were sufficient voluntary uh, suicide if your uh, crimes were sufficient would that be um, acceptable and or, or an acceptable penance. I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, like, you know, cultures have used ritual suicide as a means of retaining honor for thousands of years. Obviously, the Japanese, uh, with harakiri, for example, are ste uh, steeped in it. But the game, I don't think, really offers a definite, clear-cut answer. I think it's more of a, a situation of the people, the, the, the wrongness of what you've done is so great that people are going to retaliate against you no matter what effort you make to redeem yourself. And the game then asks, you know, can you still do the right thing in that situation where no personal payout is possible to you? I think that's very profound. I think that's very heavy. And it's not, it's not something that most video games will uh, make us sit with, will make us think about. Um, I keep thinking of, you know, the, the, the closest thing I can think of to a game that really plays with your inherent sense of morality and rightness as the character like this would be uh, the first Bioshock game where, you know, you, you think you're doing choosing to do the right thing throughout the whole game and then it turns out that you're actually uh, being, you've actually been being controlled the whole time. And... So this is this is something very new, and the other thing to remember is that you know you heard what Am just said. Don't fail as the others have failed. You know the game is not telling you 
that you're doing the right thing when you play it this way. Um, except, except obviously you get the uh, what they call the moral barometer, that bright green glow behind the characters keeps getting brighter and brighter. There is that, but it, uh, otherwise the game itself is not telling you that you're doing the, wrong, the right thing. Am is consistently telling you that you're screwing up. And I think that's so interesting because, you know, again, you think about uh, 97, most video games uh, of, of any kind, any medium, any genre, when you, did, you do the right thing and you get a reward, some kind of reward for it, whereas this game is challenging you at that. It's putting you down. It's telling you that you're doing the... Uh, it's actually telling you that you're failing, and you have to know that what you did was the right thing in absence of a reward from the entity that's running the show, which would be the Allied Master Computer. And um, so that's, I think, that that's one of the great innovations of this game. And we see it play out in, um, you know, other games, uh, other modern games more and more. You know, games like Braid, for example, which, spoiler alert in that, you play all, all the way through Braid and learn that you are actually the villain the whole time. Things like that. It's like, can you still have a sense of accomplishment without the game affirming what you were doing? So... That, again, that brings us to the end of the NimDoc chapter. Next, we will have the TED chapter, uh, one of my personal favorites, and then we will have the uh, big final showdown with the Allied Master Computer that uh, is uh, quite fascinating. So, until next time, I enjoyed getting back onto this series. I look forward to the next installments. Take care.